Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful afresh this day and kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. So we have finished our series on extraordinary women of the Bible and we have jumped straight back into the lectionary. A series of reading allocated by the Worldwide Church. There is a reading for every service for every day of the year. Now, I'm a big fan of the lectionary because it takes us to parts of the Bible which are easy to avoid. They can be challenging and difficult for both preacher and member of the congregation. They make us think, and they don't always sit very well with our modern way of thinking. Listening to the Old Testament reading today, I feel like I've sat down to watch a rather racy film, but I've missed the first half. It deals with the difficult subject of infidelity and its consequences. King David, of David and Goliath fame, is now the king of Israel. He has everything he could wish for, and more. But David is human, and for him, that is not enough. He has overseen the, restora the restoration of peace and great military might to the nation of Israel. So outwardly, he is an enormous success. He is what this nation has been waiting for. But his personal life becomes entangled with sin. He commits adultery with Bathsheba and then has her husband killed to cover up his misdeeds. In every season, God sent a prophet to each of the kings of Israel. And I think we tend to believe that prophets foretell the future, but their main role in scripture is quite distinct. They are to speak the words of God's truth in every situation. They are to speak the words of God's truth in every situation. And it's the prophet Nathan who has the job of confronting King David. In the verses just before our reading this morning, he uses a parable to lay out that situation to David. He speaks of two men, one rich and one poor. The rich man has many cattle and many sheep, but the poor man has one ewe lamb. And he protects this very closely. He feeds her, he keeps her close at night to him so that she is protected from the wolves. A traveller arrives and instead of killing one of his own animals, the rich man takes the poor man's lamb and kills it for the feast. On hearing this, David is outraged. He says that as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he has no pity. And it's at this moment that our reading starts today. Nathan says to David, you are that man. There follows a list of what God has done for David. He's been anointed, he's been rescued, he's been provided for. And if that wasn't enough, he would have done even more. But the Lord makes it clear that this is sinful behaviour and it will not go unpunished. Saying sorry is one thing. But there is a price to pay and there are consequences to our actions. When I was training for ordination, I spent some time with the chaplaincy team at Send Prison, which is a women's prison. And the Sunday before I arrived, nine women had been confirmed, having come to faith in Christ during their time in prison. And they were just filled with the Spirit of God. The first Sunday I was there, they were presented with their Bibles. And Bishop Andrew had been, and he had been so impressed with these women and the stories of the change that Jesus had made to their lives. But I spoke to one lady, and she said to me, 
I have done dreadful things, and I know I've done, and I have been sentenced, and I am very sorry. But I need to serve my sentence. I need to finish it in order for me to be returned to society. So although David went astray in private, his humiliation will be very public. Faced with the full list of his transgressions, David has the scales come from his eyes. And he says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replies, now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. In this situation, God's judgment is as a call to repentance. Calling David and all of us who are led astray to turn 180 degrees away from what is causing us to sin. Repentance means changing your direction completely. And it's in response to this challenge that David writes the words of Psalm 51, the great song of saying sorry. The Italian composer Allegri set the psalm to music in 1638. And it's said that the 14-year-old Mozart, visiting Rome for Easter in 1771, heard this beautiful music in the Sistine Chapel. And he went home, back to his lodgings, and he wrote out the full score. And then he returned to the Sistine Chapel with his score to listen again to make sure that he hadn't missed any or made any mistakes. The combination of words and music in the Miserere is very powerful and continues to move us today. It is my choice of music for the time in the Ash Wednesday service where we come forward and have ashes imposed on our forehead. Now we know there is nothing new under the sun. And you only have to turn on your television or read your newspaper to know that we don't seem to have learned anything from those who have gone before. King David has become insensitive to his sin. And the qualities we condemn in others are often our own character flaws. I wonder if there are people in our lives that we find it easy to criticise and hard to accept. Perhaps instead of asking God to change them, we might ask the Lord to help us see the world from their point of view. And then our own flaws might become a little clearer. Specks of dust and planks of wood come to mind. As part of the Alpha Course, Nikki Gumbel told the story of how bank workers train to recognise counterfeit banknotes. Instead of studying the false notes and the paper they made and the sort of um, artists and the flaws in these false notes, they spend all day, every day with the real thing. So that when something feels, doesn't feel right, they know. There's a lesson in that for us, I think. Do we spend enough time with the Lord and his word? Do we spend enough time so that we're so familiar that we recognise when something is wrong and that we should avoid it? In the reading from John's Gospel, the crowd are hungry, but they don't seem to know what they're hungry for. Jesus has just fed 5,000 people by giving thanks for two fish and five small barley loaves offered by a little boy. We're told that the crowd had eaten enough and the 12 baskets of leftovers were gathered up. The Lord is abundant in his generosity. You only have to look at what happens when you plant one sunflower seed. And this beautiful flower grows up, filled with amazing numbers of seeds to feed us or to feed the birds. The Lord is abundant in his generosity. King David knew this. The crowd, so keen to follow Jesus, I think they also knew this. And I think we know it too. In our heart of hearts, I think we do know that too. 
when the crowd asked Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus replies, the work of God is this, believe in the one he sent. Now this relies on us recognising that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one that Jesus sent to save the world. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. 100 years ago, at the Olympic Games in Paris, a young man refused to run in the 100 metre final, his strongest chance of a medal, because, because the race was scheduled to be run on a Sunday. Instead, he spent the day in church in the centre of town. But he entered both the 200 and the 400 metre races, neither of which were his best chance of a medal. But he went on to win the 400 metre race in a record 47.6 seconds, winning his precious gold medal. A year after this triumph in Paris, he returned to China, the country of his birth, as a missionary. And he died at the age of 43 of a brain tumour as a Japanese prisoner of war. He said every Christian should live a God-guided life. If you're not by, guided by God, you will be guided by someone or something else. His name was Eric Liddell, and his story is immortalised in the film Chariots of Fire, which I think is still available on BBC iPlayer. Every Christian should live a God-guided life. If you are not guided by God, you will be guided by someone or something else. So I wonder this morning, what are you looking for? Do you need to repent and seek God's forgiveness? Are you looking for a sign that God is real and wants to have a relationship with you and those you love most? Or are you like Eric Little, ready to let God guide your life for his glory? As ever, the choice is ours. Amen. <laughs>